maybe you have heard in the previous uh, presentations, um, but I'm going to come at it from a little bit different perspective um, because the agency that I work for is a regional agency. Um, I work for the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. We're one of ten state agencies in the state of California, state conservancies in the state of California, and we manage an area or work in an area that extends, covers about um, a third of the state's geographic area, ranging from Kern County in the south all the way up to the Oregon border in Lodong County, uh, all part of 22 counties in the state of California. We're about to celebrate our 10-year anniversary. Uh, this September will mark 10 years since <coughs> Schwarzenegger signed the Conservancy into law. Uh, one of the um, legislatively mandated program areas of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy was to aid in the preservation of working landscapes. Um, and that's when I first start, started becoming aware of and started working in the, in the areas of, of working landscapes. Um, the presentations that we've seen to date so far um, have really focused on, on ranching and or farm types of agricultural uses. Um, it's interesting because in the, in the, in the public meetings and the sessions that we held prior to the establishment of the Conservancy, we polled people about you know, what are working landscapes and what do they mean to you and how should they be defined and so forth. While I think we adhere um, primarily to the understanding that working landscapes are ranching, and grazing, and, and uh, other agricultural lands, there's a real good argument to be said that um, the state's forests are also working landscapes. Um, and it's of particular interest um, and, and importance to the state of California, uh, especially as we're about to see coming into um, another year of less than normal, or what we call normal rainfall. Um, the two thirds of the California's water supply originates in forested areas, and the, and the appropriate management of those forested areas, of those working landscapes, is really critical to. Um, not only the quality of the water uh, that comes out of that uh, upper watersheds, but the quantity uh, as well. Um, I think that um, we've been working really hard, especially trying to take advantage of there, if there can be a silver lining to the, to the after effects of the Rim Fire and the American River Fire that, that happened in this um, fall past fire season, is that there's an opportunity to educate the public about the beneficial uh, the benefits that can accrue from managing our forests correctly. Those, sim those same types of benefits um, are transferable to all working landscapes uh, in some form or other. And, and, and I think you guys have mentioned that as in your presentations as well, that the, the suite of ecosystem services that accrue from managing those working landscapes is um, really tangible, although it's hard to uh, monetize in a lot of areas and there's a lot of work to be done I think to extract and educate the public as to what those public benefits really mean, and um, and further to educate the public in, in that they're paying for them already, whether they know it or not, uh, in one form or another, um, they're paying for those ecosystem services. And I think that the future is is bright in helping um, the general public understand a closer connection to how they pay for that and help them to establish um, more of a willingness to pay for it up front rather than in these buried incentives or laws or things that, that you know have been established over a long time to try and eke out the services that come from those um, from those benefits. I did prepare a few notes because I wanted to cover a certain few things with this um, group tonight. Um, and I apologize I don't have slides, but there are probably some wonderful images that, that um, could be put up to illustrate some of the points that I wanted to make. Um, the, the inclusion of the, the working landscape mandate in our legislation came as a result of um, the beneficial values associated with their preservation. And almost across the board, those values were recognized throughout the region and, and throughout the state. And they really um, boil down to social values, environmental values, and, and economic values, which I know you're particularly interested in with this forum tonight. Uh, the social values I think were touched on earlier and those are associated with rural lifestyles, primarily rural rural, rural lifestyles. Um, the open space, the clean air, the healthy, healthy living, the, the hard working, no congestion types of values that people um, find very uh, attractive. I mean, a lot of people 
people are willing to pay a lot of money to live in an area like we live in here and other areas up and down the, the Sierra foothills and, and higher up. And, and there's a value there. And that value, whether it's easy to put into words, um, it's there nonetheless. Um, there are people that are willing to, to pay for that value. So recognizing that that value is there and wanting to preserve that value along with the association that I think a lot of people um, like to self-associate with a Western type of a value. Um, it's, it's a much more open space oriented, larger landscapes oriented type of a, a social benefit that, that um, really is a defining value that defines Western United States. Um, in California, you know, we're the most heavily populated state in the, in the western portion of, of the, the country, and that value is, is under threat. Um, and the, the values that have to be paid, or the ecosystem services that have to be realized to preserve some semblance of that, that western value, um, keeps increasing. Um, the environmental values, I think you've seen some great presentations tonight about the environmental values associated with um, uh, keeping those working landscapes intact. Um, and they are, um, in a lot of instances, I would say in most instances, the, the private working landscapes that are out there are relatively well managed. Um, when, when a lot of landscapes come under public management, Responsibility. Uh, they're subject to the um, funding, you know, available funding, and, and we see it over and over again that um, that uh, despite their best efforts and the best intentions of the people there to manage huge amounts of land um, that are held in public ownership, um, the incentives are are not there to do it, and uh, the money isn't there to do it. So, uh, in a lot of cases, those lands go unmanaged. They go fallow and they create a whole suite of other um, problems that, that impact those environmental services those, uh, that, that benefit all of us. So I think there's a good, a good case to be made um, and I think that uh, the farmers and ranchers and the ag producers that have been um, shepherding and stewarding these lands for hundreds of years um, are now um, recognized or more recognized for the efforts that they put forth to preserve these landscapes. Um, they are the last stewards of this landscape that all of us now are finding an amazing amount of value in. So um, looking at that um, and, and wanting to um, maintain those, those values uh, is a challenge and I'll get to that in, in just a minute. The last of the values that I touched on are the economic values. And the economic values of, of, of our working landscapes are, um, are undeniable. You know, California is the, the richest agricultural producer in the world. Um, our number one um, uh, economic engine in California is agriculture. Um, certainly for the, for the areas that, that, that I work in in Sierra Nevada, the, you know, the agricultural areas are a little bit smaller. You know, most of that is attributed to the Central Valley and the, um, the, the more arable lands, but the foothills of the Sierra Nevada are, are famous and have a rich history in, um, and I think can take credit for uh, not only the development of the state of California uh, in supporting the gold mining that they here that really financed um, the building of the metropolitan areas of this state, um, but also helped to finance the sustenance of the whole country. And, has the, the history around the agricultural um, traditions of the, of the Sierra foothills is, is rich and, and is worth preserving. Um, it's changing, the, the landscape is changing, the crops are changing, the, um, the types of um, agriculture that, that is being produced in our Sierra Nevada foothills is changing. Um, and I don't have necessarily a comment on that, whether it's good or bad, it just is. It's, it's, the nature is changing. Some of that is in, in response to um, what we're seeing in terms of climate change, in terms of drought, um, and, and the response that ag producers are forced to make to remain competitive, to remain able to produce crops with less water, um, uh, less
less land on smaller pieces of land, uh, etc. So, um, one point that I think I'd like to make is in that, um, in addition to the intrinsic values that these landscapes offer in terms of food production and, and the open space and the things that I've mentioned, um, there is also a, an amazing opportunity, uh, economic opportunity, uh, I believe, in something that, that we've been supportive of and, and trying to promote, and that's in the education and tourism opportunities associated um, with these working landscapes and working to promote agritourism. Um, there is a real interest and there is a real desire among a lot of the population to reconnect with where their food is grown, whether it's livestock or, or produce. Um, and there's money to be made, as crass as that sounds, but there's money to be made in educating those folks and helping them to reconnect in a way that they're willing to pay for and in a way that they really enjoy and they want to um, expose their, their families to and so forth. Uh, I think it's imperative and I think that there's a future challenge, particularly for the, Sierra, for the counties in the, in the Sierra Nevada region, but across the state, to foster and embrace and, and find ways to help um, empower those ag producers to do that. Um, of course, there are always issues associated with that in terms of NIMBY problems and access and um, privacy issues and so forth, but, but hopefully there's a segment of those um, producers that have an opportunity to expand their economic portfolio um, beyond just the produce or the, the livestock that they're producing to also include an educational or a tourism component as well. Um, that really touches on the really the three basic values that, that were the trigger for inclusion of those, of the, the aiding and the preservation of uh, working landscapes under the conservancy's um, mandated legis legislation. Um, I see that there are some threats to existing working landscapes and, and from, from our perspective, what I think we see is that the greatest threat um, to working landscapes is um, generational succession. And what, that, what I mean by that is that um, the majority of, of uh, ranch and farm owners now are um, in their upper years. Um, they're nearing the end of their careers. They're looking forward to retirement. And they're thinking about um, transferring these lands to the next generation. Um, now, more than ever in history, um, opportunities that are afforded to new generations um, are so broad and the attractiveness of taking over the family farm or the family ranch is becoming harder and harder and harder to sell um, because it's hard work, it takes money, it takes a, a certain amount of grit and a certain personality to want to do that and the returns are not guaranteed and the list goes on and on, why not to do it? I think there's a long list that, that is also out there of why they should do it, and, and I'm glad that there are young people stepping up to, to fill those shoes, but um, trends are showing that there's not enough of them stepping up to fill those shoes, and that the challenges that the older generation that now hold ownership of these properties are facing, which was touched on earlier, is that in this transition from one ownership the one generation to the next generation, um, they're finding out that either A, the next generation isn't interested and all they want to do is sell the property off and um, take the money so that they can go and move to where they want to live uh, and s essentially um, break up the ranch or break up the farm, uh, which ultimately um, results in fragmentation of the landscape. Um, those are typically divided into, they're subdivided into smaller and smaller and smaller parcels until they be really become um, non-viable as, as a large ranching farming opportunity. And they dramatically increase the need for uh, dispersed infrastructure, which society as a whole has a hard time paying for and sustaining. Um, so those challenges are, are, are ever present. And, Exacerbating that, that situation, particularly in the state of California, was, came, uh, comes with the, um, 
the, the, the stopping of, of funding for subvention funds from the Williamson Act. And if you're not familiar with it, the Williamson Act is a, is a, is a tool, it's a law that was um, put into place to, to help preserve those working landscapes uh, by providing incentives to landowners to enter into a, a temporary contract, usually a 10-year contract, uh, that said that they promised to keep their land in, in production, in agricultural production, for this period of time. And then in return, they get a lower um, tax assessment on their property. Um, the, the counties then um, would be reimbursed uh, for that difference that they weren't getting by the state of California um, during the recession and uh, the, the woes that the state entered into. They had to make a decision ultimately stop funding those subventions to the counties to support um, those counties entering into new Williamson Act contracts or uh, renewing their Williamson Act contracts. So it really took away a very valuable tool to keep that the, that the farmers and ranchers and ag producers could use to uh, maintain viability of their working landscapes. One, one important tool that, that has been mentioned by Justin and, and um, also in the presentation that we just saw um, was the, the conservation easements. And those conservation easements are, are one remaining tool, a NERC tool that, that, um, that the Conservancy has been supportive of and, and has funded um, in a number of um, instances through grant funds uh, to purchase um, conservation easements on these working landscapes and keep those, keep those producers on their land keep them working on their land, help them, in a lot of cases, before the generational transfer happens, um, ensure that the landscape that they've dedicated their life's work to um, remains intact after they go into orbit. So um, uh, it, it helps them perpetuate their wishes to, to keep their farm or ranch intact. And, and essentially um, places a, a deed restriction or restricts that land to that type of use in perpetuity. You know, in exchange for that, they get a, a sum of money, which hopefully they're using to also put back into the ranch or work with their families or, or heirs or whoever they are to ensure that the operations of that ranch are, are sustainable for a longer period of time as well. Um, The other big threat that I think, um, and I've mentioned this a little bit, the other big threat aside from generational succession and fragmentation is, is drought, access to water, and climate change. Um, I think California is really coming to the point where we're finally coming to terms with what's, what we thought was normal, maybe wasn't normal. And if you look at a, at a much broader picture of um, time scales, that, that probably what we're experiencing is normal. Um, and that we better be preparing for a lot more of it because it's coming. And, and I think that um, a lot of these ag producers that rely heavily on, on water and have really um, had the, the um, enjoyed the, the abundance of water uh, to date uh, to do the type of irrigating that they've done, flood irrigating and, and so forth, are quickly having to adapt their irrigation method, methods um, to ensure that they use less water and can continue to produce um, crops and, and, um, and produce. Mm -hmm. So it'll, it'll be interesting. Um, I, I think that, uh, that they're a resilient group of folks and I think that they're gonna step up and, and meet that challenge. Um, we've funded a number of grants to private producers to, to do work in that area. We're going to continue to do that, um, assuming that we have grant funding made available to us. The, the grant funds that the Conservancy has um, been using since our inception have come from California Voter Bond Act, um, Proposition 84, which was passed in 2006. Um, those bond funds that were allocated to the Conservancy for grant making are, are coming to their end. We've expended um, close to $52 million of grants. We have just a very small amount left that we're just now finishing up. So uh, the current model of, of funding conservancies in particular um, to, to support grant making has come from bond measures. 
Whether that's sustainable into the future is, is yet to be seen. Um, there's a bond measure that um, is currently out there uh, that could end up on the November ballot, uh, which has $75 million in it uh, line item to, to support the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and other amounts to support other conservancies. It's an $11 billion bond measure. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not um, the state of California, the voters of the state of California are willing to take on that debt um, is yet to be seen. That will be seen um, at the election. There are a number of bills um, going through the legislature right now that are looking at a smaller amount, um, a smaller bond amount uh, that might be more palatable to voters, somewhere in, in, the, in the neighborhood of half that amount. Um, again, we're working really hard uh, with our partners that understand the necessity of this uh, to help bring funds back into the region um, to make sure that the conservancy is, is included in that, in the language of that bond comes into the future uh, to support future efforts in around sustainable landscape as well as all the other programmatic areas that, that we work in. So, um, no, that's a good segue to the, to the sort of the concluding notes that I have and that's what the SNC um, has been doing and is doing to help aid in the preservation of working landscapes. Um, we support and participate in the California Rangeland Coalition um, which, um, if you're not familiar with it, it would be worth becoming familiar with it and, and the work that they're doing. Um, the coalition works to bring ag producers and environmental groups, environmentalists, together uh, to develop common goals for sustainable management of, of agricultural lands. Um, two groups that have traditionally been pitted against each other um, and caused a lot of problems for each other in the past, um, like with all groups that are seem to be diametrically opposed. When you get right down to it, there's only about 20% of the stuff that they disagree on and about 80% of the stuff that they do agree on. So this coalition has been really good at focusing on those things that fall in that 80% range and helping um, ag producers and environmentalists work together to, you know, for the benefit of all. Um, I've mentioned we award grants for improvement of agricultural lands to improve water quality and quantity and also to acquire agricultural easements um, in the Sierra Nevada region. We promote agritourism opportunities and we're gonna be um, ramping up our efforts to promote agritourism opportunities through the region, um, primarily through our Sierra Nevada Geotourism Project, which is a partnership between Sierra Nevada Conservancy, the Sierra Business Council, and National Geographic Society. Uh, it's an online um, website <coughs> um, opportunity that helps promote those types of we're looking at other ways as well to do that. Um, we also leverage funds and resources from other agencies and sources to support efforts for more preservation of working landscapes. Those partners include the Natural Resource Conservation <coughs> Service, NRCS that was mentioned earlier, private foundations um, to try and bring more funds and attract more funds into the Sierra Nevada region uh, specifically to help with that, with that mission. And, uh, and lastly, we sponsored county ag tours. Um, a big part of, of this is, is just helping to educate the people that live within the, the counties, our neighbors, um, as to the importance of um, the values that, that they probably, you know, maybe subconsciously were aware of when they bought here, when they moved here, why they live here, but helping them bring that to, to the surface so that they are willing to, you know, one, take advantage of the great assets that are around them in terms of agricultural assets, uh, but two, be supportive of those um, opportunities when they, when they come up, those efforts when they come up. So, happy to answer questions or if you have any. Uh, just a couple of comments um, uh, that I'd like to make sure we're aware of. Um, two things. One is right now, there is an opportunity for us to articulate some interest in working landscapes as they support the economy and to get those um, <clears throat> goals and objectives into the Placer County uh, Economic Development Plan. And that could help us get funding to do some of these projects. So <clears throat> I, would, I would invite anyone of the organizations who want to, to follow up on this meeting. And we can hold a session where we 
maybe put down three or four objectives. Maybe one of them is related to intergenerational problem. Uh, and, and we can um, get those in front of the Placer County Economic Development Board and start working to promote that message as part of, part of the overall. So I, so I think being able to speak in economic terms about these interests helps these interests. So that's one thing. The other one is that um, just some interaction between the organizations that are involved in working landscapes, there may be some uh, opportunities for us to collaborate. And one of them in particular, uh, let's just use the, uh, the issue of intergenerational problem. Uh, there has been a group meeting that is interested in creating incubator farms that allow new farmers uh, to get kind of a bridge. They're not beginners. They have experience, but they're not ready to go out on their own yet and establish their own independent business. So for a certain period of time, they function as, a, as their own business on an incubator farm. And so there, we have a chance to say on that issue and others like it, to work together to make that happen. So I, I, as far as I know now, way years ago, I was the first manager of the resource district in 1970-some-odd. And um, I'm not up to speed anymore on what's going on in the conservation organization world, but I do know that at least as far as plastic and sustain is concerned, we haven't had a session strictly on conservation interests. So I think it would be, I, I, I think it'd be great for the conservation organizations to get together and talk about what we can do to uh, have a public forum on, on it, uh, the development of a, of a strategy that we can explain to the community and where we should be going on conservation. I mean, these are, uh, if it's being done, I'm not aware of it, so. I think it's being uh, done informally. Yeah. I think I think Foster <laughs> County is I think yeah. Foster County is really a, a leader. If you look at the, the other counties in the Sierra Nevada region in terms of being proactive around that, Good. and um, and the Placer Legacy Program, you know I think a lot of counties, neighbor counties, look at that as something that they wish they could do, especially those that are facing um, imminent imminent expansion threats right now. And the conservation plan. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think it was a pretty um, a plan with lots of foresight in it, and and you at least have something in place to address the issues that, that you're talking about. Um, well, I, I would let's just whether say or not everyone agrees with it or not is another thing, but right. it, it, at least there's a mechanism, a tool that that thought far enough ahead to preserve those some of those values that people appreciated here to begin with. And, um, and a lot of counties that plan does not exist at all. Well, I asked Lauren Clark tonight, he was out of town. Roger Ingram was going to be here, and he gave me a, uh, uh, a PDF file on the state of the working landscape from his point of view, which I will publish and can get out to all of you. Um, but I would just extend the invitation that we could get. Um, those that were at the table here add, uh, you know, the county and class of legacy and uh, a few other added and sit down at the table and say, what can we do to promote our mutual interests? Okay. And maybe take some of the things that we're doing informally or at to whatever level and, and at least get all behind a couple of key initiatives and start promoting it or, or, or whatever that group wants to do. But I, I would extend that invitation. So. I, was, I just wanted to um, mention that it is um, past eight with respect to everybody's time. Right. Um, I just, I think we're having a really great conversation. I think we're getting some really good information captured. I think it's going to be a great value um, to the summit for sure. I definitely want to hear from Elisa um, on her efforts um, with the conservation district here. Yeah. And um, I just invite you all really to stay sure. and, and participate. Yeah. Well, that's a really good segue. And, um, well, over here, so I'm getting on film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody is on the side, straight.